that's kind of a little rub that'll stick you here. I always do a lot of Stephen Foster and all of my shows. How many people were here yesterday? Oh, gracious, I better not repeat any of the same jokes, but I'm in trouble. <laughs> I think I have some new jokes here. So uh, I'm going to do uh, some Stephen Foster songs. I'll do uh, two, one a famous one and uh, two not so famous. Uh, Stephen played the clarinet and he also uh, sang in quartets. Uh, so I'm going to do one from 1864 here called Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, one of my favorites. I think that and Beautiful Dreamer are about the pretty, most prettiest things he wrote. You all know, I'm sure, that he died young, broke, and no money. He ended up with 38 cents in his pocket. And uh, it's kind of a shame. Most of his money went to Edmund P. Christie of the Christie Minstrels, who had started his, Christie, his minstrel group around 1845, and Stephen started writing around 1848 or 1849. And I even have music at home that says, Old Folks at Home, written and composed by Edmund P. Christie. And when Christie died in 1879, by his own hand, incidentally, uh, he, uh, uh, all the copyrights were converted back to Stephen, so later publications show Stephen's name. Then I'm going to do Old Dog Trey from 1853. Old Dog Trey was an Irish setter that somebody had given to Stephen, and Stephen always watched the dog out the window of the accounting firm. He, was, he worked for his brother who had a steamship company, and he would do the books and be very bored with his gig because he really wanted to just do music and he'd watch his dog out there. So he wrote a song for his dog, Old Dog Trey. And I mentioned earlier that he sang in quartets. Uh, he was from Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania, and they would serenade a family in the neighborhood called the Woods Family. And uh, they would go up on the front, you know, and they'd stand out in front of them and the family would come out on the front porch and bring them cookies and whatever at the end of the little concert. And uh, a servant girl for the Woods family couldn't be out there with the family, so she would stick her head up through the cellar door. And her name was Nellie Bly, so he, he wrote a song for her called Nellie Bly. So here you go with Jeannie and Old Dog Trey and Nellie Bly. <laughs>
my lady love and make the fire burn And while I take the banjo down, give the mush a turn Hi, Nelly Cole, Nelly, listen love to me I'll play for you, sing for you, but also
shall meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one vacant chair. We shall linger to caress him when we breathe our evening prayer. When a year ago we gathered, joy was in his mild blue eye. Now a golden cord is severed, and our hopes in ruin lie. We shall meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one vacant chair. We shall linger to caress him when we breathe our evening prayer. Jenny Lynn was known as the Swedish Nightingale. 
and she uh, was brought over by P.T. Barnum in 1850. So I'll do In the Gloaming, the Lorelei, and the Jenny Lind Puka. <laughs> Uh, 
roller coaster company. So now there's a roller there's a roller coaster thing over the top of the wagon cap. So there's no more entertainment in there. I want to talk a minute about the cakewalk. Uh, people are familiar with the term, but not, most people don't know too much about it. The cakewalk was a dance, a plantation dance that was developed by the slaves, and on Sundays they would get together and uh, the master. Uh, would provide a cake and the winner of the cake walk would get the cake and they would get in a big circle and they would dance across the circle. There were there were special steps to the cake walk. It was just like any other dance, a round dance or a circle dance, square dance. There was there were five distinct steps, but the trick was to exaggerate and to really get out there. And in the vaudeville they call it eccentric dancing. Buddy Epson, for example, was an eccentric dancer, that's how he started out. So these people would dance across. Now Oddly enough, the music that we think of cakewalks today didn't appear until the 1890s. Uh, why that is, I have no idea. But the cakewalks started to appear, and I'm going to do two of them for you. Right now, I'm going to do the most famous one ever written. You may not have heard of it, but it's considered the most uh, famous cakewalk ever written. It was written by a man named Kerry Mills, who's much better known for writing Red Wing and Meet Me in St. Louis Louis. But this is at a Georgia camp meeting from 1897. Philadelphia, that's their theme song. 
And if you take a list of all the tunes that are played in the old western movies, Golden Slippers has got to come out right on top, along with Buffalo Gals. That's, you just hear it constantly in there, which is great. It's a great tune. Uh, James Bland was a black man who had, was a graduate of Howard University in Washington, D.C. His dad was an examiner in the patent office, and he had lined up a job for his son James as a congressional page because he was hoping his son would go into uh, government service like himself. Good dental and, you know, pension, health care and all that. And uh, I shouldn't mention health care, should I know? <laughs> Uh, but James played the four-string banjo, and he much preferred playing minstrel music. The minstrels were all white until after the Civil War. Once the Emancipation came through, the blacks started having their own minstrels, minstrels and they actually whited up around the eyes and around the mouth. It's a very funny deal, you know. The blacks are corking up, and the, the white guy, the, the black guys are whiting up. But Bland uh, traveled for years, he traveled for 20 years with a group called Haverly's Minstrels. If you look at the really early things, it says Haverly's Colored Minstrels. And uh, he went to Europe and stayed there for 20 years because the Europeans uh, treated the black people in a civilized manner in those days where, where they weren't in the States. But he wrote, in 1879, he wrote uh, In the Evening by the Moonlight. In 1880, he wrote uh, a, a, what we think of as a camp song today. Yeah, In the Evening by the Moonlight, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia was another one. So he's got three really good songs, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia, which incidentally in 1940 became the state song. Right now it's under review because the uh, politically correct crowd has noticed that there's dialect lyrics on that song. They don't probably realize that it was written by a black man. Uh, <laughs> In the tradition of the time, uh, it wasn't there wasn't any thought of it being a racial a slur of any kind. So here's three for you: carry me back to Old Virginia in the evening by the moonlight and golden slippers. <laughs>
Well, the slippers are still here. They had in elevators, even. You know? <laughs> Amazing how much 19th century music is still around. Uh, I uh, used to interview old-time composers and old-time piano players, and one of my favorites was Yubi Blake. You may remember the black guy that lived to be 100 years old, and they had a big birthday party for him at the, on the big auditorium in, in New York. He wasn't able to attend because he was infirm, but he played music pretty much up until he was 95. And I met him when he was 88. And uh, we were talking about the repertoire, and he said all the guys played classical music. They all played classical music. They had special things that they would play. They were real show-off things, and one of them was like the Poet and Peasant Overture. And Yubi was still playing that stuff in his 80s, and you know, he would play like the Stars and Stripes Forever, great, huge, elaborate arrangements of this stuff. So one of the marches that they played, uh, well, it is, uh, is that fiddler here? It's there was a fiddler here early, and we were talking about uh, an old march called Underneath the Double Eagle. He says, you know, the same guy wrote that that wrote the wedding march. And I said, no, I don't think so. He didn't look quite deep enough. They were both named Wagner, but uh, one was Dick Wagner, and the other one was Joe Wagner. So uh, anyway, I'm going to do you from 1894, Under the Double Eagle. This is one of those things that all the guitar players and the fiddle players still play, still around, will last forever. Sound the way you're hoping 
this kind of sound. Uh, the, the pianos in the Old West, they actually did have grand pianos in some of the some of the places. In fact, there's one in the Beeson Museum in Dodge City. There's a grand piano from the Alamo Cafe. Uh, two of the really bad pianos that they had in the Old West, uh, the, the square grand piano was probably the worst piece of junk in the world. It was, I don't know. <laughs> The square grand piano is designed with the strings going laterally like this, so that means here in the bass, your hammers are about that long because the strings are right there. But over here in the treble, they're out there about four feet. So you've got these long shanks going all the way out. You can just hardly push the keys down. Here they're just barely going down. It's just it's stupid. I mean, it's just stupid. The other terrible piano, you still see them today in antique shops. And you go in and look at them, they're, they're kind of small upright, they usually have candelabras on them, sometimes they have leaded glass in the front or angels painted on them, and you go, oh, that's only $800, oh, that's really a deal. No, those pianos aren't even sufficient quality for firewood. <laughs> <laughs> they're called English birdcage pianos, and the reason they're called that is because there's a mechanism in the back of the hammer. There's a little wire that goes up with a damper that lifts off the string. When you hit the pedal, the damper lifts off. And these little wires go up, and it's a nice little arrangement. But on the English birdcage piano, uh, they've got these wires going in front of the hammers and then dropping down in the back, which if you're trying to work on the piano, <laughs> trying to work on the hammers, you can't get to them because of this birdcage mechanism. So I, I played a concert down in, uh, I played a Western festival down in Spain. I love the internet, incidentally, because people type in Saloon Piano and my name will come up. So this guy from Spain was putting on a Sergio Leone film contest, a film uh, uh, retrospective. And so they, they had it in this little place called Fort Bravo where all those Clint Eastwood uh, movies were made down there. And uh, they said, what kind of a piano do you want? I said, I want a 52 inch upright standard upright. So I came and I saw it was a 52 inch upright, but I could tell from the back door that it was an English birdcage piano. And I, oh my gosh. And they thought, you're really going to be happy with this because we got the best, we got the oldest antique in town. And within about an hour it started breaking down and by the third day it was just virtually unplayable. But anyway, I digress. The condition of the pianos in the Old West well, it must have been pretty execrable. Imagine now all the pianos are coming from around the Boston area. That's where the piano uh, producers were. That's they were where they were building them. And they got to be transported by wagon across four or five or six states. Now the wagons in the 19th century didn't have springs on them. They were called dead axle wagons. And the box sat right on the axle. So you can just imagine what these things must have sounded like. And I don't think there was much work for piano owners in these little towns in the Old West, unless you're maybe in Dodge City or someplace like that. And then in addition to that, the hammers on the piano, they're wooden hammers, and they've got a hard piece of felt over them, and then they've got a soft piece of felt over them. Well, after playing two or three years, that soft piece of felt gets really hard. If you have a good piano guy to fix it, he'll take a little deal and he'll poke the felt back out again. But after that hardens up, it'll start to disappear, and then you've got hard felt. After the hard felt goes away, you've got a wooden hammer. So those things really sounded clattery. And, clat clattery. and I played on Virginia City's got a lot of those pianos over there that sound like that. I, I had to do a ragtime festival over there in 84, and I never drink when I play. I made an exception that day. <laughs> It was just brutal. It was a half an hour one bar, moved to the next bar, another half an hour, and they were, they were, one was just worse than the other. It was just, just horrible. So that's why I bring my own little sweet puppy with me. I, I know what it's going to sound like. I do have CDs in the back. They, they're not in the mercantile tent because I have to race off here today to be at, at a gig in Santa Barbara at 9.30 in the morning. So after my 3.30 show, I'll be hitting the trail tonight. Uh, but I do have some CDs back here. I have six CDs of Saloon Piano, uh, much uh, the same that you heard on the HBO series Deadwood. They use 64 of my tunes. And then I have another CD that I, they called me and wanted more music. And I just had a truck accident. And I had broken my wrist in three places, so I was in a cast. And then I wasn't playing very well. They wanted some music, so I said, I'll make you a town band recording. So I. I cut out part of the cast so I could play a little bit.
bit, and I, I made it a town band recording. I played two cornets, alto horn, tenor horn, sousaphone, and banjo. And I thought it sounded dandy. And they came back and said, oh, no, there was no town bands in Deadwood. So I immediately went to the internet, internet and downloaded 22 pages of the Deadwood Times, indicating that there were no less than five town bands in Deadwood in 1877. The Gem Saloon Band, the Deadwood Town Band, the Bell Union Band. They were all over the place. They were playing weddings and the funerals and the usual deal. So I got that one. So I got six, six regular saloon pianos and one town band. So I'm going to finish up with, with a little bit of ragtime. Ragtime was, of course, very at the end of the tail end of the saloon piano era, which I date from about the Civil War to about the, uh, right after the turn of the century. I don't record much after 1910 or so. Uh, but there was a woman named Adeline Shepard writing rags in 1906, and she wrote a wonderful rag called Pickles and Peppers. And two years after she wrote it, William Jennings Bryan used it for his campaign song, apparently unsuccessfully because William, Tower and Haft, or William Howard Taft won. He will be forever remembered as the fattest president we ever had. So, Pickles and Peppers from 1906, and I thank you all for coming this morning. The University of Nevada, Reno has partnered with private industry to try to develop technologies that can help save Lake Tahoe. For example, we've uh, worked with uh, Mastercraft Boating Industry and Wakeworks to develop a simple filtration unit that uh, can protect the lake from, from new species being added to the lake from boats. Another example is using scientific studies to try to understand what types of invasive species to remove from the lake and what areas to remove them from. This has led to private partnerships to develop the harvesting of crayfish at Lake Tahoe, which contributes to the decline of the nearshore algae. Uh, our studies from the University of Nevada are finding that there's an 80 to 99 percent loss of native biodiversity 
uh, uh, individuals of, of invertebrates and, and so on and so forth at the bottom of the lake or a tenfold decline in native fishes. What does that mean to the overall health and functioning of the lake? We don't quite know, but we know that the change is quite dramatic, much more dramatic than in the offshore clarity measures. So at the University of Nevada, Reno, we are basically updating and, and building out the new seismic network up at Lake Tahoe. And in doing that with the latest technologies, we have enough bandwidth to now support other types of uh, environmental monitoring, including high definition fire cameras. So one of the questions we get with regards to establishing this new fire network is how people can get involved. And so right now we're establishing a web page where people can not necessarily pan, tilt, and zoom in the cameras, but they can watch and watch uh, not only stills, but video bursts. And during fire uh, warning days or, or red flag days, they can go out there and essentially kind of have that social media interface to allow perhaps the average person on, online to essentially alert everyone with respect to a fire that's just started. In addition to the clarity of the water, which is important for nearshore as well as the mid lake, we also need to look at things like the algae that's growing on rocks. That algae is what causes uh, uh, the rocks to be slippery. It's a, it's a condition that people don't like when they go out to go swimming and kayaking and paddling in the nearshore. Um, we also need to look at the, uh, at the community, the aquatic community structure, the fish, the plants, and, uh, and the effect of aquatic invasive species on the nearshore. So this is our research area. This is our backyard. This is where we do the research to tell us how to, to better manage our environment. I think that the, uh, the politicians, the stakeholders, the residents at Lake Tahoe and the visitors all have a very strong interest in understanding what is happening in the near shore. My team of investigators at the University of Nevada, Reno has been looking into a community of small invertebrates that live in Lake Tahoe. These are microscopic invertebrates and they're smaller than what anybody has been looking at in the past. We found uh, several uh, invertebrate groups that exist in Lake Tahoe that we would have expected to find, but we've found a number of new species that have never before been described in the literature. So finding the, this community in Lake Tahoe is good news because we know that these really small uh, organisms are very sensitive and we know that they respond when there are pollution impacts or climate change impacts to aquatic ecosystems. And so as we move forward in the future, we will be able to use this community as a, a canary in the coal mine, so to speak, as a very sensitive indicator of change that might be occurring in Lake Tahoe.
Thank you.